So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. My name is Alex Brand. I am going to be talking about certificates and how we use certificates in Kubernetes and all you need to know about certificates in Kubernetes. Um, the only caveat is that I thought I would have enough time to talk about everything certificates, but half an hour is really not enough. So that all there should really have a star and what we're gonna be talking about, just a smaller scope, we're specifically going to be talking about how to use certificates to produce a secure Kubernetes cluster. Um, so just to give you a bit of background about myself and about Apprenda, we've been working with Kubernetes since early 2016. When we uh, got involved with the community, we actually created the SIG Windows, so the special interest group that's leading the Windows uh, implementation of Kubernetes, so you can run Windows containers on, on, on Windows. Um, and then I personally have been involved with uh, maintaining our open source project called the Kismatic Enterprise Toolkit, which is a set of tools that allow you to manage, orchestrate, uh, operate, and bootstrap uh, Kubernetes clusters on-prem or on the cloud. So our initial implementation of Kismatic was released in November 2016 when RBAC wasn't quite there yet. So our security model, we were secure uh, from the, from the get-go, but our security model was very, very uh, simplistic. So every single component had the same identity. All the users were using the same, the same users. So after RBAC came out in April 2017, we actually decided to adopt it because we thought obviously it's, a, it's just a better model. So uh, we adopted that model and that meant we had to just revamp how uh, we generated certificates in Kismatic. So this talk today is going to be informed on those experiences and what we had to do to uh, revamp the generation process and how to produce a secure cluster. So this is the agenda. Uh, as you can see, there's a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, hopefully we have enough time to go through it, but Basically, you know, we'll, t we'll talk about a couple things in, uh, that you need in Kubernetes and that are re related to certificates to have and to run a secure cluster. So I know we're in a security track, but I just thought I would do just a quick certificates refresher um, just in case, um, uh, yeah. So the certificates basically allow uh, parties in a conversation to authenticate each other. So if you think about a client and a server relationship, uh, the client can authenticate the server and just make sure that it's talking to who it thinks it's talking to, and the server can also authenticate the client using certificates. Um, so this is all, this all depends on the, uh, on, so one way of doing this is using a third party that both the server and the client both trust. So if, you, if they don't know each other, they don't have a previous relationship, uh, they can actually trust a third party that issues certificates to be able to trust each other. So that is where the certificate authority comes into play. So the certificate authority is actually going to issue certificates to all these parties and given that they trust the certificate authority, they can then trust each other. So if you think about when you access your bank's website, for example, you wanna make sure that you're talking to, you're actually talking to your bank servers and not some random server on the internet. So what you do is you ask your bank for a certificate and then you validate that certificate and given that that certificate has been signed by an authority, by a certificate authority that you trust, you basically trust that you're talking to the, the, the bank's server. So that takes us to Kubernetes. Why do I need certificates in Kubernetes? Why do I even care about certificates in Kubernetes? So how many of you are running a Kubernetes cluster or are in an operations team? Very nice, that's awesome to see. Um, how many of you are familiar with how certificates are used in Kubernetes and how, exactly, awesome. Very cool. So as we all know, uh, Kubernetes is a distributed system. This is a very simplistic diagram of some of the interactions between all the core components in a cluster. So we have the API server in the middle, the API server is the only component that talks to etcd, and then the API server has a bunch of clients, including the scheduler, the queue proxy, the controller manager, and the kubelet. These are basically the main, the core components of your cluster. 
And given that all these components are running on different machines that are connected through a network, you just want to make sure that all these interactions are secure and that all these interactions are basically, all the components can authenticate each other. So I'm going to walk you through how we can build a, a secure cluster using certificates. So the first thing we actually need is a cluster certificate authority. So the cluster certificate authority is going to be the, the trusted route throughout the entire cluster. So all the certificates that are used in the cluster are going to be signed by the cluster CA. And this is what's going to enable all the components to be able to authenticate each other. So all the components are going to trust that CA. And then whenever they, they are presented with a certificate, they, they actually can trust it because they've been signed by, by the CA. OK, so now that we have the cluster CA, we can actually start securing some of our interactions. So the first, the most important interaction is the API server. Um, as we all know, the API server is the main entry point to the entire cluster. So we want to make sure that we are exposing this endpoint or the server over HTTPS. And to do that, we need a serving certificate and the corresponding key. And as, as I mentioned before, the certificate is going to be signed by the cluster CA, which is going to allow all the components that are using or that are communicating with the API server to be able to authenticate it. So there's an important gotcha here with, with certificates uh, uh, for the master. And that is that when you're setting up multiple API servers, um, when you want to have an HA cluster, you actually want to make sure that the load balancers uh, IP address and DNS name is part of that uh, certificate. Um, because otherwise, whenever a client tries to talk to an API server through your load balancer, the client is actually going to try to validate that certificate and it's going to complain. It's going to say, you know what, the common name that's on the certificate is actually not what I'm trying to talk to, so it's going to complain. Um, so just whenever you're setting up multiple masters, just make sure that the certificates have the load balancer's DNS name and IP address. This is usually taken care of by your favorite installation tool. They usually have a, a configuration uh, parameter to just set the extra, extra, extra names in the master cert. So there's actually another API, which is really an internal API. It's just an internal uh, private API as of now, um, and that is the Qubits API which you also want to expose over HTTPS. Um, and then again, to do this, we need a serving certificate and the corresponding key. And this API is mainly consumed by the API server when it needs to get logs or when it needs to get metrics uh, from a, a specific uh, container and also when it, uh, when it needs to exec into a pod. So again, this cert is signed by the cluster CA and that's how the API server can actually authenticate the kubelet and, and make sure that it's talking to the, the kubelet. Similar to the API server, the kubelet's API is also protected by authentication and authorization. So this means that clients of this API also have to present client certificates. So whenever the API server has to talk to a kubelet, it actually needs a client certificate, and that's why the API server actually has a client cert um, for, for talking to the kubelet. So as, you know, as you'll notice, I have little links at the bottom. So if you want to look into it more, there's some more docs on it. Most of the slides have them. Cool. So, so we talked about how, to, how a client can authenticate a server. Um, so the next piece is how can a server actually authenticate a client? So that's where the client cert authentication strategy comes into play. So the API server and the kubelet actually can authenticate uh, clients using this strategy. So this is mainly used by Kubernetes components, um, although you could use it for user auth, although there are some important caveats. Um, but the way this works is that any request that presents the client certificate that has been signed by the cluster CA is going to be considered authenticated. Part of that authentication process is to obtain the user information and the group membership of that user. And that information is actually obtained from the certificate itself. So the user is obtained from 
the common name field of the certificate and the groups are obtained from the, the organization field of the certificate. So as I mentioned before, this authentication strategy is mainly used for authenticating core, Kubernetes core components. So each one of them is going to have its own client certificate because each one of them is going to have different access levels to the cluster. So you want to have each one of these components to have their own identity, and the way to do that is to have certificates with different common names. So for example, the scheduler has its own certificate with the common name set to system cube scheduler. You'll notice that the kubelet cert is actually special. And the main difference there, other than it belongs to an organization, is that the host name where the kubelet is running is actually part of the certificate. So that is very important because you want to make sure that each kubelet on your cluster has its own identity. Why is that important? So, bef uh, so, that, so the reason for this is that it allows you to enable a couple of features in Kubernetes which are called the node authorizer and the node restriction admission plugin. So what these do is that they actually limit access uh, to the API server from the kubelet's perspective. So without these features enabled, the kubelet is actually capable of seeing and writing and modifying every single resource on the API. Um, so you ideally, you don't want this. You want to follow the principle of least privilege. So instead, what you want to do is by having each kubelet have its own identity, you can enable this feature that will actually limit the access to the API to resources that are actually related to that node or to that kubelet. So for example, uh, instead of the kubelet being able to modify every single node resource in the cluster, it can only modify its own resource in the cluster. Similar with secrets, instead of being able to access every single secret in the cluster, it can only access secrets that belong to pods that are bound to that node. So we just went through uh, all the certificates that we need and how do we actually produce these certificates? So we can either manually create them, so an admin can go ahead and produce all the certificates, issue all the certificates that we need, or there's actually an API in Kubernetes that allows us to generate uh, certificates. So as of recently, Kubernetes offers an API that allows you to request certificates through just you know, using uh, the, the, the regular uh, 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 Kubernetes APIs. So the way this works is that a client creates a CSR, or a certificate signing request, and shoots, his off, shoots it off to the API server. Once that CSR is created, it actually is going to remain in a pending state until someone manually approves it. So the idea here is that you don't want to actually randomly approve and generate certificates, because these certificates are going to be signed by the cluster CA. So as we talked about before, every single component in the cluster trusts that CA, which means that is going to trust any certificate generated through this API. So the CSR actually has to be approved uh, for the certificate to be issued. So once that CSR is approved, um, the certificate is issued and the user can actually download it. So I actually wanna show you how this works. Um, so yeah, let's dive into a quick demo. And I have a Kubernetes cluster running here on my machine. It's a 184 cluster, I think. Yeah, 184. Um, and the first thing I need to do is to generate a CSR. So I've actually generated that previously, um, just in, in the interest of time. Um, and you can see here that I have my certificate request. And what I have to do is to actually send this over to the API server. So I actually have to wrap this in a CSR resource in the Kubernetes API. So the Kubernetes API has a CSR resource and you know, similar to a pod or any other resource in Kubernetes, you add some metadata so I can call this CSR uh, and set the name to kubecon. And then I have my spec and the most important piece here is the request field there and that's where um, the CSR is going to be uh, included in this resource so that the API server can actually uh, store it. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. 
yeah, I'll take questions in the end. Um, and I can just post this to the API server. And you'll notice here I'm, I'm using cat, but it'll just read the CSR and base 64 encode it, and then just include it in the resource. And then there we go. So I've just created my CSR. And I can actually get these, this resource similar to how I can get any other resource in the API. So I can go and do kubectl get CSR, and you'll notice that it's in a pending state. The other thing to keep, to, to keep in mind and to, and to learn from this is that the requester of the CSR is actually stored as part of the resource. And this is important for what we'll talk about next, which is how the Qlet can use this API uh, through request certificates. So I've created my CSR. And again, I have to approve the CSR. So I'm wearing an admin hat right now, and I can go and approve the CSR. So the CSR has been approved, and if I get the CSR again, the condition has changed to approved, and the certificate has been issued. So as a user, I can go ahead and download the CSR. So if I actually describe or get this resource in YAML, you'll notice that the certificate is now part of the resource. So I can actually extract this, um, this certificate using a JSON path. So that's in the status field, in the certificate field, yep. I gotta get my kubecon cert CSR. And that is base64 encoded, so I can actually base64 decode and there's my certificate. So I can actually start using the certificate. So you can imagine building workloads or, or building controllers that live on top of this API. And that's one of the interesting things of Kubernetes that you can actually use all of these APIs to build stuff on top. So that's the quick demo of how this process works. And now we can talk about a specific use of this API and that's how the kubelet can actually use this API to bootstrap itself and to rotate certificates when, when their, its certs are nearing expiration. So as we, as we talked about before, the kubelet needs a client cert to talk to the API server and it also needs a serving certificate for its own API. So instead of having the admin having to generate all the, each of these certificates, one for each kubelet and all the, all the serving certs, uh, the kubelet is actually capable of requesting certificates when it starts up. So this is, again, this is built on top of the certificates API and also the bootstrap token authenticator, which I won't go too much into, but it's basically a different authenticator that, uh, that authenticates clients based on a short token. And these tokens are basically used during the cluster bootstrapping process. So this is how this process works. So let's assume that we're bootstrapping a cluster and there's an API server and the controller manager, it's all, they're already running. So the first worker node is starting up and the qubit is registering with the API server and it's gonna realize that it doesn't have a client cert. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to create that CSR resource that we just learned about and it's going to use the bootstrap token that is used for bootstrapping clusters. The importance about the bootstrap token is that's is that it's going to tie the request back to a kubelet. So as we saw before in the demo, part of the CSR resource is who requested the CSR. So in this scenario, the, the requester of the CSR is going to be a kubelet, which is going to be important in, in this flow. So once that CSR is created, the API server is actually gonna issue a, a watch event to one of the controllers that wa that's watching the CSRs and there's a controller that's going to check whether the CSR was requested by a kubelet. Given that in this case it was, the, it's going to automatically approve the CSR. So as we saw before, CSRs have to be approved. So there's a controller that automatically approves CSRs that come from uh, kubelets. And then there's another controller that is watching CSRs that once there's a CSR that's been approved, it's actually gonna go and sign the CSR to issue the certificate and it's gonna go ahead and upload it to the API server. Once the certificate is up in the API, the kubelet can actually go ahead and download that certificate. So it can go, and as we saw in the demo, it can go and download the, the certificate using the API, and it's going to, after, uh, after that, it's gonna be able to use it for further um, API access. <clears throat> 
So just to summarize the most important steps, the first thing is that the Cubic creates a CSR using that bootstrap token. Then there's a special controller called the CSR approving controller that is going to approve the CSR automatically because the request came from a kubelet. Um, and then the CSR signer controller is going to go ahead and sign the CSR, which will then allow the kubelet to download the certificate and start using it to talk to the API server. So that's how the kubelet gets the first uh, certificate or that's how the kubelet bootstrap bootstraps its own certificate. Um, but what about rotation? So you don't want to get paged at two o'clock in the morning uh, if when your cluster uh, dies because all your kubelets fail to talk to the API server because the certificate expired. So instead of you know, getting paged, the, as of Kubernetes API, uh, as of Kubernetes 1.8, the kubelets can actually request a new client certificate when the one they're using is nearing their expiration date. So similarly, um, the kubelet can also rotate the serving certificate, and that's actually in alpha right now. There's a couple of kinks to work out. Um, but yeah, if, if you wanna share, if you wanna follow the progress on that issue, um, I, I've linked the, the issues down there. So that's basically how we can create a secure Kubernetes cluster deployment. Um, that's how certificates are used at the Kubernetes component layer. Uh, but as you might imagine, certificates are also used for different things on the cluster, once you have your, your running cluster. So one of those, those things, which is, actually, which is actually a missing, something that's missing, is the ability to revoke certificates using certificate revocation lists. So just something to keep in mind, if you're using certs for user auth, um, you currently cannot revoke certificates. So they're always gonna be, uh, they're always going to be considered valid until they actually expire. So if you wanna learn more about this or if you wanna join the discussion or if you need, uh, if you think you need this feature for whatever reason, um, definitely check out this issue on, on GitHub. So today we talked about certificates at the Kubernetes component level. So how the components themselves use certificates to uh, authenticate each other, but what about workloads? So if you want to expose workloads uh, over TLS, you can actually do so using Ingress. So Ingress um, has the ability to expose services that use TLS. And the way to do this is you first have to define a secret that includes a certificate and a private key. And then you have to reference that secret in your Ingress resource. So what's gonna happen there is that once your ingress controller realizes that there's a new ingress uh, resource defined, it's gonna go and use that secret to configure that TLS listener. So if you, if you don't wanna do this manually, there's actually an interesting project called KubeLego, which can actually uh, automatically generate all these certificates using the Let's Encrypt API. So if you wanna check that out, that's pretty cool. And then similarly, at the workload layer, um, there's actually a working group that is working towards allowing containers to prove their identity outside of a Kubernetes cluster. So inside the cluster, each workload has a service account which they can use to talk to stuff that's running on the cluster, but what about accessing external services? So there's actually a working group called the Kubernetes Container Identity Working Group which is working towards this idea of being able to use some mechanism that is going to allow containers running on the cluster to be able to access external systems uh, that are running off the cluster. Um, the other potential use case, although there's a bit of overlap with it, something like Istio, is potentially Kubernetes could do service to service, you know, mutual TLS, everything out of the box. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, these are the notes of the working group and they have weekly meetings, so I definitely encourage you to, to check those out. So just to quickly summarize what we talked about today, we went through how we can produce a secure Kubernetes cluster and how certificates are used to create a, a, a secure cluster. So certificates are key to the functioning of a, to the functioning of a secure cluster and the main reason for this is that Kubernetes, again, is a distributed system. Uh, 
and you want to make sure that all the components are talking to each other in a secure manner. And that's exactly where certificates come into play. So certificates allow all of the components to authenticate each other and to establish mutual TLS, and that is what's going to produce the, the secure cluster. We also talked about the API that Kubernetes offers for generating and requesting certificates. So we, we saw a specific use case of this, which is the kubelet, and how the kubelet is capable of requesting and generating and, re and rotating those certificates. And again, this is an API that can be consumed by, by anything other, other than just the, just the kubelet. So this is just a quick table that gives you an idea of all the certificates that are in use in a Kubernetes cluster, um, obviously at the, at the component layer. So, I mean, we talked about all the, the API server, the controller manager, scheduler, kubelet, kube proxy, and I hope this gives you an idea of how important certificates are and how careful you have to be um, with certificates. So again, you don't want to get paged at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, when one of these certificates just expires and your entire cluster is down. So I hope that gave you an idea, again, of how certificates work, how they're used in Kubernetes, and if there's any questions, I'm happy, I'll, I'll be around, and I'm happy to take them. Thanks. Hey. No, so that's a great question. So the actual component that signs the, the certificates is the controller manager. So the controller manager does need access to, to the private key of the CA. Yes, it's fairly sensitive. Um, so it really depends on how you're setting up your cluster. So some installation tools run the controller manager as a uh, workload on the cluster. So you could use a secret for that or, or something like that, yeah. Yeah. Yes? So the, the Kubelet API? Yeah, so you need a client certificate for the Kubelet as well, right? That's what you mentioned. Yeah, so the Kubelet needs a client cert to talk to the API server. But then if you want to talk to the Kubelet's API, you also need a client cert. Is that only internal? I mean, can external? Yeah, so that's a great question. So all the issues that I've seen around the Kubelet API, uh, the Kubelet API is really an internal API right now. Um, it's undocumented, so it's not really uh, maintain or yeah, uh, an API that's going to remain stable. So you, the the recommendation is to not really depend on it. Um, but I think there are people that are that are using it. Yeah. Yeah. The can. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Right. So when you're, you're, you're bootstrapping your, C, when you're sending your first CSR, I think, yeah, so you're using a bootstrap token at that point, but I don't think it'd be encrypted. Um, uh, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I can definitely look it up and, and come back to that. Yeah. Yep. So the, the majority of clusters that, at least that I've worked with, have a single CA. So there is one CA. So the CA is a single CA in the entire cluster. Um, the, the, yeah, I guess, so you're talking about signing the certificates when they're requested? Yeah, in tech, technically the controller manager, but yes, the, the Kubernetes API and the, yeah. Exactly, yeah, makes sense.
the CA continues to be the same CA. So there's one CA for the whole cluster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A uh, way to automate the generation of keys, uh, the private keys. So that really, uh, so for example, in the community, there's KubeADM that takes care of all of this. Um, so if you're thinking of uh, creating a cluster, KubeADM is a good way. Kismatic, our tool, also uh, gives you that capability and it gives you a couple other things. So uh, we take care of that, we take care of all of that for you so you don't have to do that. Um, so yeah. Uh, I think, so I'm not super familiar with that right now, but I believe there is an effort to integrate with external uh, key management software. Um, I believe there is some integration with Vault. There's a, there actually is. Um, you can actually use Vault to store secrets today. I'm not super familiar with that, so I, yeah. I'll. There's the next doc, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Right. For the masters. So the master certs are actually not generated using the certificate API. So you actually have to create them beforehand. Right, yeah, so either manually or the installation tool actually takes care of that for you. Um, so for example, Kismatic will take care of that or KubeADM will take care of that. And then it, you also... Sand for the right, yeah, you set the sand for the LV, exactly. Yes, sir? Uh, that is a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would expect them to be, after, after they're created, yeah, I would expect them to be clean, cleaned up, yep. Yes, sir? Uh, how long is the so it really depends. Um, so we, we actually issue in Kismatic, our CA is, I believe, two or three years, and the certificates that are produced by that CA are one year. No, so as of right now, the only one that gets rotated automatically is the, the Kubelet one, yeah. Yeah. But that's also every year. Yeah, every, whenever they, they're close to their expiration, they, they, the Kubelet is gonna rotate them. Yes, sir? So, uh, I have a friend that has an InfoSec department that wants to use a, their own CA. Yep. Um, key generation, yep. Um, not necessarily. So you can actually use your own CA. You can pro provide your own CA to Kubernetes and your installation tool. So for example, in Kismatic, you can actually bring your own CA and we will use that CA to produce all the, the certificates that are, that are needed for the cluster. Can you use your private key or the CA to provide it to the yes. manager? Yeah, so yeah. There's some implications there, definitely. Yeah. To to upgrade the CA, that is a great question. I believe, from what I've seen, you can only use one CA, so you would incur downtime there. I think. Yeah. I believe. That should work, yeah. That sounds like a potential workaround there. Yep. Sorry? So he was suggesting uh, adding the CA to the machines 
trusted root list so that the, the, the binary just trusted because the machine trusts it. So in the multiple master scenario, each master is going to have its own certificate. And then uh, the, the, the consideration there is to just make sure that the load balancers, uh, IP and DNS name are part of that cert so that your clients you know, can validate that certificate. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you can bring your own CA. I'm not sure if you're talking about like integrating with another system. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I think you actually have to provide like a file-based CA. Um, so yeah, at this point you have to do that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you so much, and enjoy. <laughs>